All right. You know, I have a barber. I have short hair now, so I have a barber again. His name is Ramon. Ramon, people, is a freaking genius. I've, I've told Ramon he's a genius. I'll tell everyone who's listening to me. Ramon is an absolute genius. And the reason why Ramon is a genius is because he's been cutting my hair. Well, I can't say he's been cutting my hair for like 17, 18 years straight because there was a huge chunk of time in there when Ramon didn't cut my hair. But he was cutting my hair about 17, 18 years ago. And um, I have a really weird pattern that goes to my hair. Uh, for the white people that are listening, you don't know anything about this. But there are patterns to black people's hair. And all black people's hair is not the same. And so most barbers, even black barbers, screw up my hair until they get used to it. Well, Ramon has never screwed up my hair. Not one time. I could go to sleep in Ramon's chair and he wouldn't screw up my, cha- my hair. I-, I think. But I'm not going to put that to the test. But right now, Ramon is um, working in a barber school. And in this barber school, um, this really doesn't have anything to do with Ramon. It really has to do with our educational system in general. And I would say this particular educational system in particular because it's a barber school. And I think that they are setting some of the barbers up for failure. I think that they're giving the barbers that are there an unreasonable expectation of what they can expect in the barber's chair when they leave there. And I don't think that this is right. And I'm ranting about it. And this is what I mean. When I go into there, of course, I ask to speak. I I need Ramon. Uh, No offense to any of the other barbers in there, but none of them are going to touch my hair. None of them are going to touch my head. A war would break out before they touched my head. Saddam Hussein would rise from the dead and go back to power in Iraq before any of the other barbers in this place would touch my head. So I walk in there and I'll wait for Ramon and it doesn't matter how many people he's got. If I got to come back or whatever, that's fine. But I get to sit there and I get to listen and I get to observe what's happening and what's going on. And people walk in. And when they walk in, I mean, they get pounced on like a fish. They try to pounce on me when I walk in there, but I immediately let them know. Like, basically, when I walk in there and they try to cut my hair or ask me any questions, I basically respond. Just certain things I'm simply not having. And, and what I'm not having is any of you all touching my head. So then another one will come up, and I have to say, No, I'm not having. And another one will come up. No, I'm not having. And then another one will pop up. No, I'm not having. And I have to say, Listen, I'm waiting on remote. But that's not even the problem. I'm completely getting off the point. The problem is that you have these black people that are coming in there. And, the, you know, the, the haircut's are only five bucks. So really the five dollars is to say we can screw up and you can't be too mad because this was basically free. You can't have a humongous level of expectation if you're paying five dollars. It's just really uh, something that the psyche of the human being doesn't allow you to complain as much so they think if you're only paying $5 for something. <clears throat> but you'll have these people that'll walk in and they might be black and you'll have all of these white barbers that are fighting over cutting their hair. And you might have white people and they might assign them to a black barber. Now, I know I'm constantly accused of being racist. And I'm honestly telling you that I'm not. But in the real world, that's a real world scenario that you're hardly ever going to run into. You are not going to find white people that are going to go into a barbershop with black barbers and sit down in that chair. If you've got a white barbershop and you've got a black barber in there, he most likely is waiting on other black people to come in there. And then they will have to sit in the back of the barbershop while waiting for the one black person to become free. Because they're not going to sit down and let Seth and Dylan cut their hair. Neither is a white person going to walk into a black barbershop and let Kareem and Mustafa cut their hair. It's not going to happen in the real world. So if you are trying to bring people up in an educational environment where they're getting real world experience, you might want to give them a real world experience and segregate the barbershop because the barbershop is more segregated than the church. And that's just reality. 
That's not Sir Darrow trying to start a race riot. That's not Sir Darrow trying to start a race war. In fact, I think this school is trying to start racial riots by giving these white people the expectation that black people are going to sit down in their chair when they become professionals and vice versa. If any of those barbers are silly enough to believe that that's what their reality is going to be when they become professionals, quote unquote, then they've got another thing coming because it's not going to happen. Muammar Gaddafi will move to the United States, run for president of the United States and win by a landslide before that becomes the reality. Now, you know, as I say this, though, I think about black people and we have this whole thing about um, uh, about people, other black people in particular, coming at us with 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 sharp knives or instruments or weapons. And I'll be very honest with you in the in the barbershop are the most highly advanced weapons ever. You could kill someone in a barbershop before anyone could even think about it. And that's another reason why you don't want to sit down. I mean, imagine if you're a black guy and you're sitting down in a white person's chair who might not particularly like black people that day. He may have walked in on a situation the night before where his daughter, he heard moans and groans coming from her room. He went in there. A black guy's crawled inside of uh, his daughter's window is now on top of his daughter doing the do. Now you're sitting in this chair. I don't think that's the situation you want to be in. Let me tell you something, people. As bad as men do as bad as the white man and I'll use that phrase the white man as bad as he doesn't want to see a man having sex with his daughter as bad as that is he let me tell you he doesn't want to see her having sex with a black man even more he he can't just you know walk up and kick the dude's ass because stereotypically white people are led to believe that they can't beat up black people so he's really got, he really has not, he, he's going to pretty much close the door and say, oops, sorry, let me know when you're done. But now that you're in his chair, he's going to get back at you. And you can't take that chance as a black guy. First of all, he's not going to be able to cut your hair well in the first place. That's, that's point number one. But point number two is that you're giving him a weapon while you're just sitting there as a sitting duck. How idiotic can you be? You know, there are some black people who have grades of hair similar to white people. Louis Farrakhan would be one. He ain't going to go into a barbershop and sit down in a white person's chair. Even though their, his hair is closer to theirs than it is the traditional black person. But that might actually be for different reasons. Louis Farrakhan really doesn't want to sit there and, uh, and let a, a, a white person with such weapons uh, at, his, at his head. But as liberal as Martin Luther King may have been, and he wanted to bring the races together, I'm sure Dr. Martin Luther King, as he envisioned black people and white people holding hands, going to restaurants together, being able to sit down at the same toilet and talk to one another, being able to use the same urinals, I'm sure that even that man did not envision integrated barbershops. You know, also, before I end this rant, when you're in the barbershop, you know, a lot of people get shaved. Now, let's think about that. You're lying back. How trusting do you have to be of a guy to lie back and let a man sharpen a razor and then put it to your throat right near your jugular vein and scrape? Let me tell you. Black people don't want a, a white man near their juggler vein because whether you are doing it on purpose or realizing it or not, when you've got a knife, which is what that razor is, it's a really highly advanced knife, at a man's neck, you're actually determining whether or not he's about to die. I know it sounds crazy, but you're deciding right then and there whether or not he's going to be alive in a couple of minutes. And there virtually is nothing he's going to be able to do if you make the decision that it's time for him to die. Now, why we sit there and allow other black people with a knife at our neck is a completely different story, too. I think that I, that's the real, even Ramon, I don't allow Ramon shaving me. Because I don't know whether or not Ramon's having a bad day. And all of a sudden, he now slips with a knife. And the next thing you know, I'm what, I, I look like Nicole Brown Simpson sitting there inside of the um, a barber's chair. 
And that I don't want. I don't want to become Ron Goldman just because Ramon is having a bad day. So I, I let him approach me with clippers. But as, as much as I adore the dude, I have not gotten to the point that I'm going to let him at my throat with a knife yet. And I don't advise any of you to do that. Any of you black people out there, any of you white people out there that are still in 2011 allowing people to lean you back and take a knife and put it to your throat and scrape, you're out of your damn mind. And if for some reason you die, it's like MCS said earlier about the people who stayed in the hurricane. Maybe you deserved it. We'll be right back. Sir Dale Radio. Sir Dale.